Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Retro Gamer Diaries. Today, I wanted to continue my computer gaming history by talking about Sir Clive Sinclair, legend. Who is this man you say? Well, Sir Clive is an English entrepreneur and an inventor best known for being a pioneer in the computing industry and also as the founder of several companies that developed consumer electronics in the 1970s and early 1980s. His inventions covered the world's first slimline electronic pocket calculator, wristwatches and portable TVs. Sinclair then moved into the production of home computers in 1980, with Sinclair Research Limited producing the Sinclair ZX80, the UK's first mass market home computer for less than £100, and in the early 1980s the ZX81, ZX Spectrum and the Sinclair QL. Sinclair Research is widely recognised for its importance in the early days of the British and European home computer industry, as well as helping to give rise to the British video game industry. For me, he's the daddy of the ZX Sinclair Spectrum and all those brilliant games I've played for days and days during the 1980s. I still to this day have fond memories of Manic Miner, Jet Set Willy, Lunar Jetpack, Hunchback, Ghostbusters, Ant Attack and so on. I also spent many an hour trying to program basic code from my computer magazines into those rubbery buttons. The games were pretty basic at the time, but for me I felt that I was a computer game programmer. These were the days where these new and cheap home computers allowed millions of people to discover for themselves what a computer was all about, and these days were pure magic. However, I must say it wasn't all plain sailing for Sir Clive. It's fair to say that Sinclair had several commercial failures, including the Sinclair Radionics Black Watch wristwatch, the C5 battery electric vehicle and the Sinclair Research TV80 flat screen CRT handheld television set. I mean, come on, blow me that C5. Come on, Clive, really? Eventually, the failure of the C5, along with a weakened computer market, forced Sinclair to sell most of his companies by 1986 in particular to that fella Alan Sugar of Amstrad. You know, that guy at the office. You know, you're fired. Him. Through 2010, Sinclair concentrates on personal transport, including the A-Bike, a folding bicycle for commuters which was small enough to fit in a handbag. He also developed the Sinclair X1, a revised version of the C5 electric vehicle, which never made it to the market. Funny that, Sinclair. Funny. Sinclair was also appointed Knight Bachelor in the 1983 Birthday Honours for his contributions to the personal computer industry in the UK. Therefore, I wanted to dedicate this episode to the story of Sir Clive Sinclair, legend. Our story starts in London during World War II. Clive Sinclair was born to George Sinclair and Thora Edith Ela Marles on the 30th of July 1940 in Elan, Middlesex. Sinclair's father and grandfather were engineers. Both had been apprentices at the shipbuilders at Vickers. Clive's grandfather, George Sinclair, was a naval architect who got the Paravane, a minesweeping device, to work. Clive's father, George William, also known as Bill Sinclair, wanted to take religious orders or become a journalist. However, George suggested to his son that he train as an engineer first. Clive's father then became a mechanical engineer and remained in the field. At the outbreak of World War II in 1939, he was running his own machine tools business in London and later worked for the Ministry of Supply. During 1940, Clive's parents left London for safety to stay with an aunt in Devon, where they eventually moved to Tainmouth. A telegram arrived shortly afterwards, bringing the news that their home in Ealing had been bombed. These were desperate times. Sinclair's father then found a house in Bracknell in Berkshire. His brother Ian was born in 1943 and his sister Fiona in 1947. 
Sinclair attended Boxgrove Preparatory School, excelling in mathematics. Sinclair had very little interest in sports and found himself out of place at school. And by the time he was 10, his father had financial problems. He had branched out from machine tools and planned to import miniature tractors from the United States. He had to give up the business. And because of his father's problems, Sinclair had to move school several times. After a time at Redden School, Sinclair took his O-levels at Highgate School in London in 1955 and his A-levels and S-levels in Physics, Pure Maths and Applied Maths at St George College, Weybridge. During his early years, Sinclair earned money mowing lawns and washing up in a cafe, earning 60, which is about 2.5p, more than the permanent staff at that time though. Later, he went for holiday jobs in electronic companies. At Solarton, he inquired about the possibility of electrically propelled personal vehicles. Sinclair applied for a holiday job at Mullard and took one of his circuit designs. He was rejected for pre-consciousness. While still at school, he wrote his first article for Practical Wireless. And after he left school at the age of 18, he sold miniature electronic kits by mail order to the hobby market. Sinclair's micro kit was formalised in an exercise book dated 19th of June 1958, three weeks before his A-levels. Sinclair drew a radial circuit model mark 1 with a components list cost per set 9.11, which is about 49 and a half pence, plus coloured wire and solder, nuts and bolts, plus a celluloid chassis for 9 shillings. Also in the book are the advertisement rates for radio constructor at the time and also practical wireless. Sinclair estimated producing 1,000 a month, placing orders with supplies for 10,000 of each component to be delivered. We're already starting to see the beginnings of this young British inventor. Sinclair also wrote a book for Berners Publishing, Practical Transit to Receivers Book 1, which appeared in January 1959. It was reprinted late that year and then a further nine times after that too. His Practical Stereo Handbook was published in June 1959 and reprinted seven times over 14 years. The last book Sinclair wrote as an employee of Bernard's was Modern Transistor Circuits for Beginners, published in May 1962. At Bernard Banaby, he wrote 13 constructor books in total. Wow, genius. After raising funds to start the business by writing articles for Practical Wireless magazine and borrowing £50, Clive Sinclair founded Sinclair Radionics Limited on the 25th of July 1961. Radionics initially developed hi-fi equipment. It released its first product, the Sinclair Micro Amplifier, in December 1962. The assembly and distribution of this product were contracted out to Cambridge consultants. In 1963, Sinclair Radionics introduced their first radio with the Sinclair Slimline in kit form at 49 shillings and six pence. That's about £2.47 in sterling. A year later, in 1964, Sinclair released the X10 amplifier, one of the first commercial Class D amplifiers. In the same year, Sinclair released the Micro 6 matchbox size radio, which the company claimed was the world's smallest radio. It could also be worn on your wrist with the transistor. In 1965, the Micro FM debuted as the world's first pocket sized FM tuner receiver, but was unsuccessful due to the technical difficulties. Despite problems, illegal clones were produced in the Far East. Sinclair's final 1960s radio kit was the 1967 Micromatic, biled as the world's smallest radio like Sinclair's earlier radios. The Micromatic was a reasonable success and was sold until 1971. 
In May 1971, Sinclair Radionics made 85,000 sterling profit on 563,000 sterling turnover. The following year, that increased to 97,000 on a turnover of 761,000. Wow. In 1966, Sinclair Radionics re-entered the hi-fi market with the Stereo 25, a low-cost pre-amp control system. Production was then halted in 1968 due to the low supply of transistors, which had been purchased in 1964 as rejects from other manufacturers. Therefore, in 1969, it was replaced by the Stereo 60. And this soon became Sinclair's most successful audio product, being the second product of the Project 60 range. The Project 60 products sold well and were supplemented by the Project 605 kit in 1972. It was eventually superseded by the more advanced Project 80 kit in 1974. In May 1973, Sinclair Radionics generated 1.8 million turnover and the last Sinclair Radionics Hi-Fi product was the System 4000 in 1974. During the majority of the 1970s, Sinclair focused on building the most affordable pocket calculators with the best design. In 1972, Sinclair released the world's first slimline pocket calculator, the Sinclair Executive, for £795 sterling. The calculator only included basic maths functions and the LED display required much power. It is often credited as being the world's first attractively styled calculator that did not require mains power to be used like prior calculators. The executive was a phenomenal success, earning Sinclair 1.8 million in profit. In 1973, the slightly larger Sinclair Cambridge was introduced at a far cheaper price of 29.95 sterling plus VAT. In addition to expanding the Cambridge range, the Sinclair Scientific was launched in 1975. It was a scientific pocket calculator for the very competitive price of £49.95 sterling. In 1977, a revised model, the Scientific Programmable, was released at £29.95. Then the Scientific Programmable Mark II was released later, reducing the price to £17.22 sterling. Sinclair also attempted to capture the top-end calculator market with a Sinclair Sovereign, available in plated gold or silver. The calculator was critically acclaimed for its excellent engineering and design and enjoyed short success. However, success was not always the case. Final attempts at the mass market for calculators, the Sinclair Enterprise and the President just did not sell well at all. This is the newest way to tell the time, the Black Watch, developed in Britain by Sinclair. It's electronic, no moving parts. Digital, to tell you the time precisely. And quartz controlled, so you're sure that time is right. In fact, for a year, we'll replace your watch free if it doesn't keep time to a second a day. Look out for the Black Watch in today's papers or tomorrow. In August 1975, Sinclair introduced the Black Watch Digital Watch at 1795 sterling in kit form and 2495 sterling ready built, although this wasn't available to buy until January 1976. Including a five digital LED display, it suffered from technical flaws related to the design of the case, the chip, the battery and accuracy. 
Apparently the chips had been tested in the damp winter months, but in the dry summer the design was rather sensitive to static, causing the timepiece to freeze. Not ideal on a watch I have to say. Coupled with this, the battery performance was terrible and there were issues with the overheating and even explosions. Wow. Not only was the watch unreliable, Radionics was not able to fulfill the orders it had taken. Gee whiz, this is not sounding very good is it? As a result, Radionics made its first loss in the financial year April 1974 to April 1975. In April 1976, Sinclair's accounts showed a loss of 335,000. Ooh, so Sinclair, keen to keep research going, went to the recently formed National Enterprise Board for Assistance. The NEB agreed to buy a 43% stake for 650,000 sterling, as the calculated sales at this particular time were actually strong. The Black Watch fiasco had devastating effect on the Sinclair's finances and the company would have gone bankrupt had it not been the government through the National Enterprise Board stepped in to support it. In 1966, Sinclair Radionics developed the world's first portable television, the Microvision, but never attempted to sell it because the development costs would have been too high based on the complicated design the Microvision used. As already mentioned, the National Enterprise Board bought a 43% stake in Sinclair Radionics during April 1967 for £650,000 sterling and in October, the National Research and Development Council agreed to provide £1 million in sterling for a revived portable TV project, which was finally launched in January 1977 as the Microvision TV 1A and Mon 1A at £99.95 sterling. This is claimed to be the world's first truly commercial pocket television. It's being launched by an English company in London today, in America later this week. There's a million pounds gone into the research and development for this model. 650,000 pounds of that comes from the National Enterprise Board. So this is one of the things we hope will be making money for Britain abroad this year and in years to come. Whether it does or not, you can at least say that it works and that it goes into your pocket. It'll work on the US, Japanese, continental standards. Just about any country that has television, you can use this set. And it covers all the bands. Is there a secret secret in this? There's, there's nothing that can't be copied now that it's available. It's been secret up until now. But of course, it's a great deal harder than it might appear. And there's a, there's a lot, indeed, to discover about it. The integrated circuits are completely radical. They're our own design. But also, the tube is completely new, and so are the tuners. There's hardly a part in it that isn't completely fresh. Well, now, is it going to be a gimmick or a status symbol or what? I consider, think it's a very serious product. Um, although it's a two-inch picture sounds small, when you see it, it's perfectly clear. You've got, you've, it, 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 you can see as much detail, just as clearly as you can on a full-size set at home, because it's closer to you. You're watching it about this sort of distance. Supply exceeded demand, and 12,000 units were left unsold until they were sold off cheaply. This resulted in a £480,000 sterling loss for Sinclair. Sir Clive Sinclair was certain that the TV1B model released in 1978 would be more successful, but sales were disappointing. Oh dear, dearie me, huh? Not having much luck, this guy, is he? In July 1977, the NEB increased its stakes in Radionics to 73%. By June 1978, Sinclair Radionics was working on the New Brain Microcomputer Project, which was later taken on by Newbury Laboratories. And sadly, in May 1979, the NEB announced that it intended to sell Radionics calculator and TV interests. They were bought by the ESL Bristol Group. And in July, Clive Sinclair resigned with a £10,000 golden hat shake. While Sinclair was dealing with the NAB and had seen problems developing, he had a former employee, Christopher Curry, establish a lifeboat company called Science of Cambridge Limited in July 1977, called such that they were located near the University of Cambridge 
and plan for Curry to develop technology from ideas from that university. An early product from Science of Cambridge was a risk calculator kit which helped to keep the company financially afloat while selling in surprisingly figures creating a revenue of £50,000 sterling. By the time that Sinclair had left Radionics and joined Curry at Science of Cambridge, inexpensive microprocessors had started appearing on the market. Sinclair came up with the idea of selling a microprocessor teaching kit and in June 1978, Science of Cambridge launched the MK14 kit based on the National SCMP chip in June 1978. As Sinclair began working on the MK14 successor, Curry was in discussions with Herman Hauser and opted to leave Science of Cambridge to co-found Acorn Computers with Hauser in 1978. Acorn became a direct competitor to Sinclair's products with the Acorn System 75 as its answer to the MK14, effectively an MK14 chip with a keyboard. To follow up on the MK14, Sinclair started looking to build a personal computer. At around about that time in 1979, Pre-made systems such as the Commodore PET cost around about £700 sterling and Sinclair believed he could get the price of a system to under £100. Keeping the cost low was also essential for Sinclair to avoid his products from becoming outpriced by American or Japanese equivalents as had happened to several of the Sinclair Radionics products previously. In May 1979, Jim Westwood, a former Sinclair Radionics employee, Sinclair hired for his new company, started the ZX80 project at Science of Cambridge. It was launched in February 1980 at £79.95 sterling in kit form and £99.95p ready built. The ZX80 was advertised as the first personal computer for under £100 and received praise for its value and documentation. However, it did face criticism for screen blanking during program execution, small RAM size and the keyboard design. But despite all that, it was very popular straight away and for some time there was a waiting list of several months for either version of the machine. Well, it was a new market which was dominated by the Americans and where clearly if the cost could be reduced substantially, the, the market could be expanded. Clive Sinclair was well known for a succession of cheap, miniaturised electronic gadgets. From tiny televisions to pocket calculators. In 1980, Sinclair launched his first computer. It could be bought for £100, less if purchased as a kit, and it plugged into any television. Programmes were sold on cassettes, playable by a cheap cassette recorder. Sinclair's computers took over most of the British market. And for a short time, even in America, he was selling more machines than the three market leaders put together. They turned up everywhere. The ZX80 was immediately successful, and besides sales in the UK, Sinclair also sought to introduce the computer into the United States. Science of Cambridge was subsequently renamed Sinclair Computers Limited, and then again to Sinclair Research Limited. Well, this is it. This is the television set of the future. This one's only a prototype, but a model very much like this, but certainly with a television screen only three quarters of an inch thick, will be going on sale sometime next year, and for less than 50 pounds. And when that happens, it seems certain to revolutionize the whole of the television industry. Because a flat screen, large scale television, unlike a conventional television, can simply be hung on the wall instead of bulking large into the room. And that is almost certainly the way that things will happen, because this television set is the invention of a remarkable man called Clive Sinclair, whose inventions in the past have, in one way or another, affected the lives of every single one of us. My object is to find people's real needs, to develop products which are of real benefit to people in whatever way, and to do that at a price that they can afford to do for 10p what anyone can do for a pound. Before breakfast every day, Sinclair runs six miles from his home in Cambridge, showing the kind of single-mindedness and stamina 
which has also allowed him to keep ahead in the consumer electronics field. His list of firsts is staggering, beginning with the first pocket calculator. He followed this with a breakthrough in cheap digital watches, the black watch. Then he brought out his revolutionary two-inch TV, the microvision. And most recently, he's been marketing the first personal computer, the ZX80. The price? just under £100. But Clive Sinclair isn't just a designer and inventor. That slightly vague and boffinish air of his is deceptive. He's also taken on the complex and demanding job of looking after the manufacturer of his inventions and selling them in a mass market. It's in this area of commercial activity that some people say that Sinclair is at his weakest. And it's certainly in this field that he's had his only substantial failure to date. Nonetheless, Sinclair has been as ingenious in his business methods, selling by mail order, for instance, as he has been in coming up with one scintillating invention after another. You chose to sell your products then through mail order. Why did you choose that method of marketing? The original reason was that it gave us a low-cost entry to the marketplace. The reason that we've maintained it is that we've found um, that it's the ideal way to introduce a radical product. It's very hard to sell a really new type of product through the shops. The public aren't aware of its existence. The shops don't know if it'll sell. So if you start off with mail order, it both informs the public of its existence, gets you some early orders, and the shops can learn that the product does have a market. But aren't there limitations to that approach? It's not one that we found to fail in any case to date. Um, clearly, if the product were too expensive or perhaps too cheap, it, this, this approach wouldn't work. It has to be a particular type of product, though. It must be radically new so that people are so excited by the idea, a proportion of people, that they will send off their money for it. But it does limit you to radically new ideas. Is that well, to your taste? It's, it's, it's the other way around. That, 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 that's what we see as our business. Solder is this side. Yes. I'm side. ZX80 is a complete computer selling for just under £100 and it's supplied with a manual. It plugs straight into a conventional television, straight into the aerial socket. There's no modification of the set and if you wish to record your programs into a standard cassette recorder. And the great thing about the ZX80 is that although there were computers before that were available to individuals to buy, they cost several hundreds of pounds. We've brought it down to under a hundred pounds without any sacrifice. You can learn to program on it and subsequently use it perhaps in your job or at work. Is the cheapness of the thing the particular advantage of it? In your a big mind? breakthrough that we've made is to get the cost right down. Um, it is a true and complete computer, and generally speaking, one computer can do much what another one can do. Obviously, it, is it as efficient as the others on the market? Oh yes, very much so, and indeed, in terms of speed, which is the only real measure of comparison that's normally made, it's actually faster than, than any of the other personal computers. Now, you've been selling it for just over a year now. How's it going? Well, extremely well. It's now the world's best-selling computer, which in, in just under a year is, we think, a very exciting achievement. And we're selling over 10,000 a month. Most, of course, to export. We sell 4,000 in England a month at the moment and the rest abroad. What kinds of people are buying it and, and what are the main uses they're putting it to? We, our target really at, at, the, at the start has been to sell to people on the basis of learning to program themselves or perhaps for their children to learn to program. Children are programming very widely now. First of all, so that they can understand computing or perhaps enjoy it. A lot of people it's, it's becoming a hobby for. And secondly, so that they can understand the application of computers at work. Well, they may not use our little computer at work, but they will understand the, the big computer that is used at work. They c could use it and can use it in, 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 in a myriad ways. You could store a complete, all your names and addresses of your friends on it and in conjunction with a printer, print out address labels for Christmas cards. Um, a businessman can store his expenses on it and compute them each day. You could store VAT calculations. It, as with any computer, indeed, um, but we wouldn't like to suggest that the home is going to be run by it because we don't feel that's the way computers are going. And the main function is education? The first step is education. The second then comes the period when people will use computers, but they're not going to be able to use them until they've, they've learned about them. And so that's the aspect that we've concentrated on. Second, there will come the large library of programs we're preparing. Now, this used to be the world's smallest television set. It's the Sinclair Microvision, of course. And it's pretty impressively small by anybody's standards. 
But nonetheless, it does have this, what, six inch bulky casing behind the television screen. The reason for that is that this television set, in common with all conventional television sets, has its cathode ray tube and its gun behind the television screen. The gun being the thing that transmits the beam onto the screen, and the length of the gun determines the size of the television set. Now, Sinclair's latest trick in the development of this flat tube television set has been to get all the parts and the gun in the same plane as the television screen. And the beams of the gun are bent onto the television screen. The effect of that is that the whole works is only three quarters of an inch thick. At present, Sinclair has got just a pilot production line underway next door to his old premises at the mill. But he says the prospects for the flat tube project are looking good. We've managed to make the tube very cheap to produce because it uses only two pieces of glass, one of which is vacuum formed, another one which is flat. We silk screen on the electrodes and we have an automated assembly. So our flat tube will actually be cheaper to produce than a conventional picture. So the final set, will cost less than 50 pounds for a set that will work anywhere in the world with radio built in as well. What kinds of extensions might there be of the, of the principle? Well, this is just a first step. There's nothing to stop us making larger pictures. The principle's applicable to bigger pictures, to big, big, bigger screen sizes. We can incorporate it in computers, which we plan to do, and we can use it in a projection mode for really large wall pictures in full colour in the future. When do you expect that it'll go on sale? 82 for the, for the pocket set, the time delay being caused by the need to build the automated plant. And then we couldn't say when we'll have a large colour set, but it'll be some years after that. And will this be available by direct sales again? How we'll launch it, I don't know. But it, it'll, it, it, even if it's initially by direct sales, it'll certainly be in the shops soon afterwards. There's something I want to put to you that's been said to me by people in the city. They've said that you'd be better off if somebody put you in the back room and locked you in and you got on with your inventions and somebody else looked after the business end of things? Well, if that happened, the products would never get onto the market because nobody has ever come to me and said, that's a fantastic new product, I shall now go and market it for you. And the thing is that the computer side, not, not, the computer business, for example, is extremely profitable. We, we had 13 years of unbroken profitability at Radionics and we've, we're a highly profitable business now. So we do know how to make money as well as the products. On hearing that the BBC was preparing to run a television series to teach viewers about computing and programming, both Sinclair and Curry pressured the BBC to choose computers from their respective companies to use as their primary tool. This pushed the development of the Sinclair ZX81 ahead as Sinclair's standard for the BBC. The ZX81 was designed to be small, simple and above all inexpensive with as few components as possible. Video output is to a television set rather than a dedicated monitor. Programs and data are loaded and saved onto compact audio cassettes. It uses only four silicon chips and one KB of memory. It has no power switch or moving parts with the exception of a VHF TV channel selector switch present in some models. And it has a pressure sensitive membrane keyboard. Its distinctive case and keyboard brought designer Rick Dickinson a Design Council Award. The ZX81 could be bought by mail order pre-assembled or for a lower price in kit form. It was also the first inexpensive mass market home computer to be sold by high street stores led by WH Smith and soon many other retailers. The ZX81 marked a point when computing in Britain became an activity for the general public rather than the preserve of businessmen. Ultimately, the BBC chose Acorn and standardised on a successor to the Acorn Atom, originally named Acorn Proton, but ultimately branded as the BBC Micro. Despite losing out to the BBC, Sinclair's push had established the ZX80 and ZX81 as one of the most sold brands of computers across the UK and the United States, and as well as establishing a deal with distribution in Japan with Mitsui. 
a number of user groups, magazines and third-party accessories for both computers started to appear. The ZX81 was hugely successful, more than 1.5 million units sold. In the United States, it was initially sold as a ZX81 under license by Timex. Timex later produced its own versions of the ZX81, the Timex Sinclair 1000 and the Timex Sinclair 1500. Timex brings the power of the computer within reach of more people than ever before. Introducing the Timex Sinclair 1000, the first of a new generation of computers designed to be easier to use and to own. For $99.95, power to learn at the speed of light, power to organize with unfailing accuracy. The Timex Sinclair 1000, power is within your reach. Spent a fortune on a computer. Know what I found out? I hate computing. Computing? I love it. <laughs> I hate it. It's terrific. Oh, she loves it. Computing? <laughs> Why spend a fortune to find out how feel about computing when you can do it on a Timex Sinclair 1000 for $49.95. Who knows, you might love computing, or maybe not. A Timex Sinclair 1000. I thought I'd hate it, but... Ta-da! In April 1982, the ZX Spectrum was launched at £125 sterling for the 16KB RAM version and £175 sterling for the 48KB version. It was the first computer in the ZX line to support colour output. The ZX Spectrum remained more affordable than other computers on the market including the BBC Micro, the Commodore VIC-20 or Apple II and during a time of recession and high employment in the UK was positioned by Sinclair as a low-cost home computer for productivity applications. In recession, British computing was a miraculous exception. A manufacturing industry that wasn't sacking everyone. If it's got a keyboard, a manual and computer written on it, it'll sell. That's the word around the exploding market for personal or home computers that simply plug into a television set. We're the world's largest producer of computers. We make more than the whole nation of Japan put together. Technological innovation had met 80s entrepreneurialism. The perfect mix for a leader who was a science graduate as well as a free market evangelist. So I'm Minister, this is a small home computer. It also proved to be a popular gift for teenagers and young adults that year. This led to a number of these young people learning to program on the ZX Spectrum, using its newfound colour support to make quirky video games inspired by British humour, which they sold through word of mouth and mail order. So-called bedroom coders using the ZX Spectrum gave rise to the start of the UK's video game industry. Three Northumberland schoolboys they have turned their classroom computer lessons into money-spinning bestsellers. Um, that's basically because... David Edwards receives his first big check, all part of the huge rewards open to the computer whiz kids. More than a million British homes now have a microcomputer. The British firm of Sinclair made the breakthrough, and the British now have more home computers than anywhere else in the world. Most of the users are youngsters, taking to the computer as naturally as adults now use the telephone. Sales of microcomputers will double this year. And just as important, the youngsters will buy millions of pounds worth of software as well. Software is another word for the programs or series of instructions which make the computer work. Now with me is Shelton Frey, who's just turned 11, I think, Shelton. Could you do something for me on the computer? Let's say make it draw a red square. Yes, I can. I'm giving the computer, what, half a dozen instructions and up mm. comes the red square. But to write a whole computer game would need hundreds of such instructions, all painstakingly typed in one by one. And it's for that reason that most people who don't have the time or the skill prefer to buy ready-made programs, which take the form of audio cassettes, which are loaded into cassette players and are then played to the computer. Shelton, would you be able, for example, to program me into the computer? Yes, yes, as a little could... man, as a little man. You could do that? Yes. Computer software 
today is for intellectually talented young people what the rock business was a few years ago. And yes, there'll always be the publisher, the producer, and the distributor who will seek to make money out of the business, but the talent can also get fabulously rich, even though they're young. The path to riches can start wherever youngsters have access to a computer, and that's often in the classroom. In Northumberland at the Prudhoe County High School, three sixth formers head a computer revolution which has swept the school. They do this at lunch times after school, even before school in fact. We find that the computers are running you know, from early morning until late evening, and uh, they're doing all sorts of work related to computers, and the three boys are part of that sort of setup within the school situation. Jeffrey, Stephen and David write computer games and market them under their own JSD software label. You see, that's, that's where the frog's being printed on. Oh, yeah. So you colour 129? Yeah. So we should... Yeah, let's try putting a colour 129 in there. See what effect it has. Yeah. So that was obviously set back. To get it right requires a prodigious attention to detail. Yeah. We'll check that later. I think the problem was we forgot the semicolon off. So it was scrolling up as it was progressing. So I'll try taking that off and see what But the results are worth it. A game which the boys claim is better than those previously available and a product for which local shops have already paid them. We've had the Orkin for about two weeks now. Um, it's selling pretty well. The best thing about it is its graphics, its sound and its colour. Unfortunately, there's no software out at the moment for it. Well, that's, that's the main reason why we're buying this Orkin. Their first task is to get to know everything about how the new home computer works. Now they'll spend as much time as they can spare from their A-levels writing the programs which they hope the users will buy. It's so that we get into the software market first. Since it's a brand new computer, there's no software around. And since we're into writing software programs, then we should be able to uh, get there first, write the programs. How seriously do you take it? Is it just a hobby or do you really expect to make some real money? Well, um, we feel that with some more retail outlets, it could really take off now. Um, we'll have to put it on ice somewhat through university, but we intend to carry it on in a small way until after university. And after that, the sky's the limit. By 1984, over 3,500 games had been released for the ZX Spectrum. Today we'll be doing a special Superstore software checkout to put the so-called top 10 games to the test. Well, where better to come to do it than the centre of London's hi-fi and electronic shops, Tottenham Court Road. But now, a bit of a confession to make. As yet, I know very little about computer games, so I need three ready and able and willing volunteers. Here they are. Dominic. Duncan. Cassie. Well, Dominic, Duncan and Cassie, let's get inside and get the coordinates for the computers, OK? There you are. I thought I'd lost you. Well, here we are inside at our micro point. And to be absolutely fair, when we play the various games, we're going to be using the same computer for each of our volunteers. And then when we've played each game, we're going to give each game marks out of 10 in various categories, like playability, how much fun the game is, whether it's good value for money, the length of time it takes to set the game up, and so on. And the first game we're going to play is Manic Miner. You remember that was number one on our chart. Manic Miner is all about a little miner who stumbles down a forgotten old mine, and in order to get to all the goodies at the bottom, he has to pick up various golden keys on the way. Uh, Duncan, what do you think of Manic Miner? I think it's good, but it makes too much noise and the colours are too bright. What about the, the game itself, though? Well, do you find it too difficult? Well, I can only do one sheet. It could be a little shorter, but other than that, it's really good. What about you, Dominic? I, I think it's got very good graphics, especially because it's got 20, 20 sheets, but each one's got a different different picture and um, it's got different moves to everything you press, so it's... Extremely complicated program, it's good fun. Okay, Cassie, and what do you think of it so far? I found it a bit difficult, really. What did you think of the uh, graphics? I thought they were quite interesting, but I didn't like the colours much. What about the noise? Oh, no, I wouldn't be able to stand the noise for much longer than about ten minutes. So, 
together some very good reactions from our volunteers for game number one, Manic Miner. Now we move on to our second game, also number two in the charts. That's Attic Attack or Attic Attack. I think it's Attic Attack. And the idea is that you play the part character like a serf or a knight and you have to get out of the evil haunted castle as quickly as you can getting past all the various obstacles in your way. I thought it was really interesting. I liked all the colours and the graphics and everything. It's the best of the two we've done so far. The game's really good. It doesn't get too long. The best bits are like uh, is when Frankenstein and Dracula and come and drain your blood. And <laughs> And the turkey runs out, so and you die. It's really good. That's really good. Yeah, you die. Well, you can get killed about three times, I think, and there's loads of different rooms. If you found new rooms all the time, it could last forever. Perish the thought. He'd be at it in years to come. <laughs> Well, an even better reaction for Attic Attack, our second game and number two in the charts. Well, now we move on to an attack of another sort for our third game, and this time it's Ant Attack. And this should be very interesting because its graphic is uh, three-dimensional, and you have to choose whether you're going to rescue a girl or a boy, and you have to get them out of the walled city of Antesha as quickly as you can, not being attacked by the ants. How do you think that uh, Ant Attack compares with Attic Attack? I didn't think it was as good, actually. I, it completely confused me. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't control it very well. It is hard to control, and it isn't as good as Attic Attack. But it is quite good, and the graphics are good, because they're 3D. Well, I prefer a bit of colour anyway, so I thought it was a bit boring. I thought it was a bit better than Attic Attack, because um, it moved, moved things around. It was where Attic Attack only moves the keys around. Even it told you what to do, and it said, you silly, you blew yourself up and things. <laughs> yeah. He said, have another go, and I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> as well as looking at the top three computer games, we thought it would be only fair to have a look at one of the brand new releases. And the game we've got set up at the moment is called Bear Bother, and a very rough explanation of what the game entails is that the little bear has just bought a brand new motor car, and he has to get the batteries on which it runs out of the house by climbing up and down the ladders but on the way, he can be a bit bothered. It's a bit boring. They could make it not so large. It's got too many levels. There was three sort of lines where there could be two instead. The graphics were nice and bright, but yeah, it was too large, I thought. There were lots of things chasing you, and the only thing you had to do was push down down things, and the way you kept on getting killed, it was too, it was too hard. You couldn't, you couldn't get a hang of it or anything because there's so many things coming after you. There's four things, there's, there's three bears and there's one dragon and, and you're just one person, they go all over the place. <laughs> you're absolutely bothered. Yeah. How long do you think you could actually spend sitting in front of a computer game trying to master it? it depends which game it is. With that game, I, think, I think I'd get bored with it. How about value for money? Would you spend your pocket money? No, I'd buy better games. Right, we've had your comments very briefly. I'd like to know which game you like best. Cassie? Attic Attack. Dominic? Um, Ant Attack. Attic Attack. Attic Attack. Right, now, I've got all the marks down here which you've secretly given me. Before we report back to Superstore for our accurate computer checkout, would you like to add them up on the computer for me? Thanks, Dominic. And Dominic got busy with the adding up and he's brought the checkout scoreboard back to uh, Superstore with him and we can have a look at uh, our compilation of all the marks now. Well, there's no surprise that at the bottom of the checkout chart, are you alright with that Dominic? Can you hold that up a bit darling, that's it. Uh, we have Bear Bother and that's got low marks in uh, every category and was the only game that the players didn't want to buy. Now all the games cost around six pounds. At number three is Ant Attack, which has got good marks for setting up and getting started, but low marks for the 3D graphics. And our panel gave it low marks also because it was a bit tricky to control. Now in second place comes Manic Miner, which incidentally is the number one position on the uh, National Opinion Poll chart, but we didn't agree with them, which everybody found much too noisy. And at the top of the chart is Attic Attack, which had high marks for graphics, playability, and was the game that the players said would last forever. Well, the first brand new video games top 30 will be published in the Daily Mirror next Saturday and in Computer and Video Games Monthly magazine from March the 16th.
1982 pushed on, the Department of Trade and Industry were setting up a second promotion of microcomputers in primary schools after the success of the BBC's computer programme early in the year and orders for the Spectre began arriving, causing Sinclair to begin work on their own educational software alongside Macmillan Publishing, including the fabled Learn to Read series and Horizon programmes. Get your child ready for school with Learning Box. The continued success of the computer market continued to help boost Sinclair's research profit. In 1982, the company had a pre-tax profit of 9.2 million on a turnover of 27.6 million. Sinclair himself was estimated to a net value of over 100 million in 1983 two years after launching the first of the ZX computers. With the additional funds, Sinclair converted the Baker and Wadsworth Mineral Water Bottling Factory at 25 Willis Road, Cambridge into the company's new headquarters. The headquarters won an environmental award in January 1984 for the eternal design, including an enclosed atrium, a conversion of the existing mineral well into an integrated environmental control system. As usual with Sinclair, the company image was as important as the products they were shipping. By February 1983, distribution of the Spectrum was widespread. As well as WH Smith's, Boots, Curry's and John Menzies were able to stock systems through Sinclair's main distributor, Prism Micros. 200,000 Spectrums had already been sold by mail order, mainly 48KB models, and now 15,000 units were being sold per week in the UK alone, excluding the other 30 countries where the system had also launched, albeit on a much smaller scale. The popularity of the ZX Spectrum spread to Western Europe. While Sinclair could not import into Eastern European countries, still within the Soviet bloc at the time, numerous low-cost clones of the ZX Spectrum sprung up within these countries, further boosting the start of video game developed by similar bedroom coders. The ZX Spectrum went on to become the UK's most sold computer, selling more than 5 million units before it was discontinued in 1992. Sinclair Research Computers accounted for 45% of the British market in 1984, including those from British and American companies. The TV80 Pocket Television was then launched in September 1983. It used a flattened CRT unlike Sinclair's previous portable televisions. On Earth, the first pocket television you really can fit in a pocket was unveiled today. It's British, and on price and technology, it looks set to beat the Japanese at their own game. It should also bring some jobs to Timex in Dundee, where the tubes will be made. Sinclair's Pocket TV is so cheap, just under £80, because it's the first in the world with all its electronics on one microchip. For Clive Sinclair, today's launch is a climax to six years of research, costing four million pounds. It's very much the smallest and lightest, but it also has the brightest picture, and we believe the best picture in the business. It's the very first set to just have two controls. It just has a single tuning control and single on-off volume control. In a conventional TV, the beam is fired through the tube at a phosphor behind the screen. That's how the picture is created. In Sinclair's Mini TV, the tube is bent through a right angle to save space. That's why it's so small. Sinclair's main rival is the Sony Watchman, but that's three times more expensive. The inside of the Sony shows why, a mass of complicated electronics. Sinclair has designed all his electronics on one microchip to cut costs. Sinclair set automatically adjusts to receive any kind of television signal in virtually every country. Batteries are expensive, about three pounds each, but they last for 15 hours. You could watch your new Sinclair in the Ritz, but you don't have to be rich to buy one. You do, however, have to be patient. They won't be in the shops for a while yet. And if you're waiting for a color version, don't hold your breath. It'll be some time before even Clive Sinclair can manage that. 
The TV80, unfortunately, was a commercial failure, selling only 15,000 units and not covering its development costs of £4 million in sterling. Dearie me, thank God for a ZX Spectrum, huh? The ZX Spectrum successor, the Sinclair QL for Quantum Leap was officially announced on the 12th of January 1984, shortly before the Apple Macintosh went on sale. You are about to witness Sir Clive Sinclair's Quantum Leap. He's come up with a computer to rival these machines at a fraction of their cost. The Sinclair QL system with a massive 128K memory, color monitor, and four professional software packages, 698 pounds. Firm 200 or 200 for your nearest stockist. Contrasting with its predecessors, the QL was aimed at the serious home user and professional and executive users markets, from small to medium-sized businesses and higher educational establishments, but failed to achieve commercial success. Here's an interview with Sir Clive where he believes he can take on the success of the MSX. Well now, here at the computer fair at Earl's Court and watching that item on MSX with me, Sir Clive Sinclair. Sir Clive, MSX, is it music to your ears or does it represent a significant commercial threat? Certainly not a commercial threat to us. I mean, it's quite clear what's happened here. Japan and America have both, strangely as it may seem, failed to do anything like as well as Britain in the personal computer business. They've suffered very badly from this. The Japanese companies, Sony and many others, have tried again and again to enter the British market and succeed here. They've tried again and again to enter the American market and succeed there. They haven't done very well there. So they've got together to try and form a common standard. They've had that common standard in Japan now for a year or so, hence all these, these computers. But what should be realized is that all those companies together, all of them, throughout Japan, make fewer computers than Sinclair Research on its own at the moment, but surely the threat comes when people start getting into their high street electrical stores and seeing well-known names, the Sanyos, the Sonys, the Toshibas, offering computers next door to their accepted electrical goods. Fine, yes, it's like, um, but what happens is, is this, it's just as if all the car manufacturers have got together and said, let's all have the same engine, the same gearbox, the same axle, and let's use the one that was designed five years ago. <laughs> Won't that be great, you know? Nobody will have to have to bother about it, you know, they'll all take the same spare parts. But it'll be a five-year-old car and they'll all be the same. All right, well now let's turn to something that wasn't designed five years ago, the QL. We have a number of queries about the Sinclair QL that have come in over our electronic mail. This is typical of many from Dale Adjit, who lives in Exeter. And he says this, could you please ask Sir Clive two questions. Why the QL has no cassette port and why it has a half the operating system sticking out of the back of it? Right. It has half the operating, or had half the operating stick sticking out of the back, because we issued some early ones in that form. That's no longer the case. They're all built into the, the machine. All right, let me just stop you there, then. For those early ones, are you going to update them for the people who bought them, Absolutely. or are they lumbered with it? Absolutely. No, no, we, we, we told them that we were... I'm afraid they were guinea pigs in a sense. We thought they'd like a machine early rather than no machine at all. They had the machine with the bit sticking out, but that will be updated as soon as possible, very soon indeed. In right. What about the cassette port? There's no cassette port because there are two micro drives built in. And, of course, they'll do the same job much faster, 10, 20 times faster. Don't you think it's a little sad that people who have Spectrum software on micro drive can't just plug it into the QL? Ah, oh, well, that's... It may be sad, but you see, that's really what, what MSX does. If it was MSX, you could do that, but you'd have a five-year-old machine. Now, this machine is roughly 20 times as powerful as the Spectrum. And the Spectrum, by the way, is two or three times as powerful as the MSX machines. So those are the sort of standards we're talking about. If you've got this enormous leap, there's no way you can, you can do this. Any more than you could plug a, uh, a Jaguar engine into a Mini. Nobody's ever disputed your capacity as a salesman, sir. <laughs> now, the other question that we've had, had this from lots of people. Lovely machine, where are the manuals? <laughs> well, sad, I'm sorry about that. It was, a, it was a blunder. We send out some manuals with some of the pages missing. But that's all been corrected. Every single person that had a manual has had it updated. You said it. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. While the ZX Spectrum has an 8-bit Zilog Z80 as a CPU, the QL uses a Motorola 68008. The 60008 is a member of the Motorola 60008 family with a 30-bit internal data it registers but an 8-bit external data bus. Software houses have had a, a problem with our machine and with, say, the Apple Macintosh because the 68,000 chip was a lot to bite off. It's a very much more powerful chip 
and the Z80 that we've used previously, or 6502, that Apple have used previously. It's a very powerful chip indeed, and it's taken the software hires longer than we or Apple expected to come to terms with it. The exciting thing is, on the other side of the coin is, that having achieved that, having got, come to terms with it, they're producing some very dramatic software. The QL suffered from several design flaws. Fully operational QLs were not available until the late summer, and complaints against Sinclair concerning delays were upheld by the Advertising Standards Authority in May of that year. Particularly serious were allegations that Sinclair was cash in checks months before machines were shipped. By autumn 1984, Sinclair was still publicly forecasting that it would be a million seller and that 250,000 units would be sold by the end of the year. Well, from the Spectrum to the QL, and welcome to Clive. Thank you. Now, last week, David Carlin was here and was telling us that most of the initial problems with the QL had been overcome. Has it, in fact, been relaunched? It's been relaunched, yes, in the sense that we've now got all the software, we've overcome all the problems, I may say, not, not just some of them, but all the, all the initial problems. And so we've relaunched in the sense that we've shown to all our dealers and to all the software houses all, all, everything that's available for it. We now have a very wide range of software and of course a w wide range of peripherals from other manufacturers. Now, the QL didn't really address the mass market that you were hoping for in its sort of first launch. Is it mainly the software that you think is going to make it do that this time round? Well, I don't think it was just the, the lack of software last year that, that made, it, made the results less than we expected. Um, it was the, the early teething troubles and the fact that we just couldn't make, make the machines in the early part of last year. But now we've sold all that, but even Allowing for that, we sold over 50,000 machines last year, which is more than any other serious machine. Clearly, it's much less than a machine that sells principally on games, but that's not the category the QL is in. So we're very confident that it'll be, continue to be the very best-selling um, serious machine. Now, some of those 50,000 you know, existing QL users have been writing to us. One problem they have at the moment is that you've now said that the QL club membership is now free. Mm -hmm. And they've asked us to put the question to you, can they get their £35 money back? Um, well, we hope that they found the, the club valuable and, the, and they paid for it, so I uh, know they can't. I mean, we, we did, we, that was a deal we did then and we've got a new deal now. So, no money back for the existing not, users. No. Now, the QL does use a sort of a, a non-standard operating system. It also uses the microdrives that we were talking uh, about last year. Non-standard. It's, it's our standard. It's, and, yes. and you could say that the Spectrum is non-standard, but it, there is, you know, because it's the most popular machine by far, then it is a standard in its own right. Okay, but QL it's not compatible with a number of other machines that are available on the market. The no question two is machines really, really are compatible with each other. Right, but the question was really is, do you think that that has addressed a problem that the software houses have had in terms of getting the software ready? No, not at all. The software houses have had a, a problem with our machine and with, say, the Apple Macintosh, because the 68000 chip was a lot to bite off. It's a very much more powerful chip than the Z80 that we've used previously, or 6502 that Apple have used previously. It's a very powerful chip indeed, and it's taken the software houses longer than we or Apple expected to come to terms with it. The exciting thing is, on the other side of the coin is, that having achieved that, having got, come to terms with it, they're producing some very dramatic software indeed, and it's now coming through with a rush. They've solved their problems. Right. Now, moving on from the QL, sort of slightly into the future, the most recent news from Sinclair Research is obviously of the portable. Can you let us know or give us some idea of what its main features will be? Right. I can say something about it, but not, not all about it. It's a, the first portable machine from Sinclair will be out next year sometime. We haven't got an exact date. And the first machine will be Spectrum-based. The reason for it being Spectrum-based is there's so much software out there already for the Spectrum and such a large user base. I mean, there are millions of people, literally, that have Spectrums who we believe will be potential customers for the portable. But the portable isn't, isn't just a Spectrum repackage. It's a completely new machine, which is Spectrum compatible. And my feeling about portables is that eventually all machines will be portable. But what holds that back at the moment is that the today's portables are a severe compromise in at least two ways. One is the display just isn't satisfactory. Right. Most portables use a liquid crystal display, and wonderful as that is a technical achievement, wonderful as that is as a technical achievement, it, the, the, the appearance is very deficient. So you obviously have other plans for your display? We have our own technology there, yes. That you can talk about? or? Uh, yeah, well, I can say, say what it does. But may I just mention that the, yeah. the other deficiency, and that is price. I don't believe that anybody is going to, um, in the long term, well, I don't think that people in general are going to pay a premium price for a portable. What they need is a, is a portable that is not a compromise in any sense, so that that can be the one machine they have, and has the additional advantage of portability at low cost, and with batteries that will run for a long time. Now what about the display? 
Well, our objective is to provide in a portable the same quality and appearance of display that you get in a monitor today, so that there's no compromise. And what technology are you going to use to well, do that? Well, that's our own in-house technology, and we can't reveal how we do it. So wait and watch this space in yes. it. Okay, now at the same time you announced news of wafer scale integration. Can you give us some idea of what that is exactly? A wafer scale integration is making your memory all in one wafer, as is normally done, but instead of chopping it up and putting all the chips in different packages and throwing away the good ones and putting the bad ones, putting the good ones onto a board on a laborious process, keeping them all on the wafer. Now, wafers have imperfections, so you need some special technology to do that. And we have a, a world lead in this. We're the first people, we believe, who crack all the problems. And we will be bringing out our first wafer product later this year, which will be a plug-in um, Winster equivalent, if you like, for the QL. So it'll be a, a small package that plugs into the end of the QL, does the same job as a, as a Winchester, It is very much more compact, very much lower power consumption, just runs off the QL power, and of course much more reliable, it's got no moving parts. So you're getting completely away from the idea of, I mean, last week we were looking at micro drives and floppy disk drives as an alternative, you're going sort of two steps further That's right. into the wafer scale. Yes. We knew, of course, right at the start, that one day the wafer scale would be there. And so we foresee the package being, you know, micro drives your program loading, and then the wafer scale giving all the, you know, the best, the highest speed in a, any drive of any sort, anywhere. Now, the wafers would also seem to be an ideal thing to put into the portable. Yes, that's so right. So you have plans along that yes, side Yes, the, well. the portable won't come out with a wafer drive in it, but we are planning a... a a, a, a sort of upmarket portable, high performance portable, later on, which would have a wafer drive built in. Okay, now these are wonderful plans, but at the same time, you must realise that I think the Financial Times said you needed £50 million pounds to get both these projects off the ground. No, no, no. no. The £50 million pounds is just for a new company entirely, which would make the wafers for the future. Not the first generation of wafers, that's already underway. This is a, for a completely new company. But um, at the separate same... business indeed, to build an actual massive factory to make wafers. Right. But at the same time, Guy Cuny is telling us sort of week after week on the news item that the city is, is really panicking about sort of investing in the high technology industries. What makes you think you'll be able to raise the money where other people have failed? Well, two things. Um, our record and the record of the people that will be involved in the project. Finally, Sir Clive, um, you're seen within the UK computer industry as an entrepreneur and sort of a hero, if you like. At the very beginning of the program in the series, Guy Cuny asked for some ideas on the ultimate and perfect micro. Can we let the viewers have some idea of what uh, your idea of the ultimate micro would be? It'll be in the house and you'll be able to talk to it and it'll talk back to you. You'll sit down in front and it'll recognise you and wish you good morning and mean it and understand everything you say and you'll be able to ask it about your health and any problems you have. Well, we look forward to seeing that either from yourselves or from somebody else. So, Clive, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I've no idea whether today is a typical day in the life of Sir Clive Sinclair, but he is a bit of a mega star of the micro, so it's perhaps not very surprising that Micro Mega have produced this little game for the Spectrum, based on a hypothetical day in the life of Sir Clive, in which he gets up to all the things you'd expect him to do. Going to the bank to deposit large sums of money, going to the palace to get knighted, and rushing around London in his C5, although I've always rather thought that he was more of an Aston Martin or a Porsche man myself. Well, stay, that's their idea anyway. Unfortunately, the QL production was suspended in February 1985 and the price was halved by the end of the year. It ultimately flopped with only 139,454 units being manufactured. From next week, the Sinclair QL, now priced at just under £400, is to be reduced by 50%. And although Sinclair originally promoted this machine as being capable of more serious applications, it failed to make any inroads into the business computer market. The development of the ZX Spectrum Plus began in June 1984 and was released on the 15th October that year and made available in WH Smith's stores the day after its launch. 
The 48K Spectrum introduced a new QL style case with an injection molded keyboard and a reset button. Electronically, it was identical to the previous 48K model. It was also possible to swap the system's boards between the original case and the Spectrum Plus case. It retailed for £179 sterling. There was also a DIY conversion kit for the older machines. Initially the machine done quite well, it did actually outsold the rubber key model by 2 to 1. However, some retailers reported a failure rate of up to 30% compared with a more typical 5 to 6% for the older model. In early 1983, the original Spectrum was officially discontinued and the ZX Spectrum Plus was reduced in price to £129 sterling. Retailers stocked the device in high quantities, anticipating robust Christmas sales. And nevertheless, the product did not perform as well projected, leading to a significant drop in Sinclair's income from orders in January, as retailers were left with surplus stock. The ZX Spectrum 128 was released in Spain in September 1985 with development financed by the Spanish distributor Investotronica. However, the launch of this model in the UK was postponed until January 1986 due to the substantial leftover inventory of the prior model, the ZX Spectrum Plus. It all seems doom and gloom here at this point. However, I have to say the game scene was still doing very well and some really great games were available for the ZX Spectrum. Let's have a look at the 1984 clip of Chris Tarrant talking about some of these great games. This is the ZX Spectrum, a small, very cheap computer that's found its way into more homes in Britain than any other. Now, there are many, many games designed for the ZX, but not many quite like this one. Ever since some real-life insects sabotaged an early computer, the word bug has been used to mean a problem in a program. This wickedly clever little game shows what bugs are all about. The sentences you see are the lines of a real computer program. Each flashing letter marks a gap in the program. Micromouse is out to plug those gaps. Bug monsters try and walk all over him and frequently succeed. There's just one letter left to fit in. Go on, pal. Go for it. Go on, pal. Once the letter's in, the program's complete, and it tells the computer to do something spectacular. This ingenious and educational game is called Micro Mouse Goes Bee Buggy. It's from MC Lothlorien and runs on the ZX Spectrum. Good, eh? Now, as opposed to one-armed bandits and such like, computer games don't normally try and make you think that you might actually win a lot of money from them. But this next one not only deludes you into thinking that you've got £200, but it then promptly takes it all straight back again. This cheeky chappy is Honest Clive the Bookmaker. Any resemblance to Clive Sinclair, the inventor of the Spectrum computers, is purely deliberate. You're off to the races, you've got £200 in your pocket and it's time to place your bets. There's my nag on the far side at number two, Mr Spit. Believe me, my sons, this one is a dead set. Grand National is an unusual and exciting game from computer rentals. Up to five players can play, and you can make the odds on the horses longer, shorter, or make them up. It runs on the ZX Spectrum. Come on, Mr. Spit, come on, look at him go. He's catching the lever. Come on, Mr. Spit, come on, come on. A particularly atmospheric and absorbing game is called the Skull. You find yourself in a strange three-dimensional maze dotted with shimmering gold pieces, green crosses and bronze coins. You move on to these treasures to pick them up, and the idea is to collect as much treasure and points as you can without losing your lives. Oh, and try and watch out for the trapdoors. 
The colourful and creepy skull is from Games Machine. It runs on the 48k Spectrum and will be out soon for the Commodore 64 and other home computers. One thing to remember is that the skull can be deadly. very hard to put your finger on computer games. They're a bit like films, they're usually fun to watch. They're a bit like books, there's usually some sort of plot to unravel. They owe a lot to board games, but they owe a lot more to fairgrounds, mazes and age-old puzzles. They're something new and they're extremely hard to classify. I mean, what on earth would you call anything as completely balmy as this? This is the amazing Manic Miner on a seemingly impossible quest. The Miner has to dodge and outwit all kinds of loony nasties, such as poisonous pansies, those rabid toilet pans, and of course the mutant telephones. Mutant telephones? Well, Manic Miner is a gamer's game full of weird in jokes. It's also a sequence of brain teasing tests, each an ace computer game in its own right. And every now and then you get a terrible sinking feeling as the floor crumbles beneath you. This wickedly clever game gives you three lives, and at the end of your third life, you get the boot. Manic Miner is from Software Projects and is available on the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum. But a game doesn't have to be so complicated. Rommel's Revenge simply transforms you from a seven-stone weakling sitting in your armchair into a seven-stone weakling driving a tank. The more tanks you blow up, the more points you get. That round thing up there is your radar screen. And if you see any dots, then enemy tanks are near. These three-dimensional effects are one of the most distinctive features of Rommel's Revenge, which is from crystal computing for the ZX Spectrum you get the sense of moving up to distant objects. And bits of odd-looking scenery are useful cover for an ambush. A fat lot of good that is, however, if... an enemy tank sneaks up the other side of you. Well, even Rommel had his off days. But of course, not all computer games are stuffed full of graphics. With some of them, there's not a single picture to be seen. Instead, you find yourself in the middle of a baffling adventure story where you've absolutely no idea where you are, no idea quite where you're going, and no idea what grinning, grisly, long-haired monster is waiting for you at the end of some long, dark tunnel. And in the middle of all that, somebody asks you a question. Hmm, yes, I do want that silver knife because I've got a funny feeling that something nasty is on its way. This is Volcanic Dungeon, a classic adventure game in which you try to rescue an elfin princess imprisoned in a crystal coffin deep within a volcano. Carmel, who invented this addictive slice of fantasy, have also concocted this. This is the Kingdom of Beroth, first of six awesome adventures in the mighty computer quest called Black Crystal. You have to fight so fast it's almost impossible to keep track of what's going on. But since a flying lizard has glutted itself on my remains, I think I may have lost. And if you do finally master the amazing difficulties of playing that game, you go into a new adventure in a creepy place called the Castle of Shadows. Now, when you get out of there, you have to find your way around the Shagath's Lair, the Temple of the Fire Demon, and at last you get into the Tower of Beroth, where lies the evil Black Crystal. Now, to destroy the evil Black Crystal, you have to surround it with the rings you've collected in the course of your other adventures. You're confused. Imagine how I feel. And Carmel aren't finished yet. Now they've come up with the Wrath of Margra. Margra is the Witch of the Black Mountains and you have to use magic spells to win through this adventure. The game has split-screen, high-resolution graphics. Time plays an important part. 
When night falls, you know that horrible things are going to happen. You should also watch out for these, a staggering total of over a hundred weapons that you can use in your quest. Everything from a spiritual sword to vampire bat saliva. Volcanic Dungeon, Black Crystal and the Wrath of Magra are all in the Third Continent series from Carnell Software. The people who make computer games are continually trying to improve old ideas and dream up new ones. But every once in a while, along comes a new game which marks a complete breakthrough and sets the standard for a whole new generation of software. Valhalla is the latest such game. It's based loosely on old Viking tales with a cast of gods, giants, dragons and a funny looking black raven. The really special thing about Valhalla is that the story unfolds whether you do anything or not like an epic film which you can step into and become part of. Hmm, at the moment in this epic film I appear to be getting killed by a god called Boldir. There are six adventures you can embark on, each one a quest for a special object hidden in the game world. When you die, you don't just die, you actually go to hell, which looks a bit like Basingstoke. Valhalla, a truly unique fantasy adventure game, is from Legend for the 48K Spectrum and Commodore 64. This is Caesar the Cat, a game so brilliantly animated that it's fun to watch, let alone play. Here it's running in a new version for the ZX Spectrum. Originally, Caesar was available only on the Commodore 64. Let's have a look at that earlier version. Same cat, same idea, but different computer. Caesar is a moggy in a well-stocked larder who tries to keep a band of hungry mice from the food. But if you're not careful, Caesar only succeeds in making a hole in the best family crockery. You lose points every time he knocks over a dish, but you gain points every time he catches a mouse. This graphic masterpiece is from Mirasoc and is for the Commodore 64. The Spectrum version will be out soon. At the January 1985 Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show, Sinclair re-entered the United States market, announcing the FM wristwatch radio, an LCD wristwatch with a radio attached. However, the watch had several problems and never went into full production. Imagine a vehicle that can drive you five miles for a penny. A vehicle that needs no petrol, just a battery. And that takes the press of a button to start, the squeeze of a lever to stop. That needs no license, no road tax, and you can drive whether you're 14 or 40. A vehicle that costs just 399 pounds. The Sinclair C5. It's a new power in personal transport. The Sinclair C5, 399 pounds. Want to buy one? Want to see one? Or simply want to read all about it? Just dial 100 and ask for free phone C5. Now. Despite the continued domination of the home computer market with the ZX Spectrum, Sinclair hoped to repeat his success in the fledgling electric vehicle market, which he saw as ripe for a new approach. On 10th of January 1985, Sinclair unveiled the Sinclair C5, a small one-person battery electric recumbent tricycle. It marked the culmination of Sir Clive's long-running interest in electric vehicles. The C5 turned out to be a significant commercial failure, selling only 17,000 units and losing Sinclair £7 million sterling. 
It has since been described as one of the great marketing bombs of post-war British industry. The ASA ordered Sinclair to withdraw advertisements for the C5 after finding that the company's claims about its safety could not be proved or justified. The combined failures of the C5 and QL caused investors to lose confidence in Sinclair's judgement. In May 1985, Sinclair Research announced their intention to raise an additional £10 to £50 million sterling to restructure the organisation. Given the loss of confidence in the company, securing the funds proved to be a challenging task. In June 1985, Robert Maxwell disclosed a takeover bid for Sinclair Research through Hollis Brothers, a subsidiary of his Pergamon Press. However, the deal was terminated in August 1985. The future of Sinclair Research remained uncertain until the 7th of April 1986, when the company sold their entire computer product range, along with the Sinclair brand name, to Alan Sugar's Amstrad for £5 million. So Clive Sinclair, the man who first put computers in Britain's homes, has sold his business to a rival, Amstrad. The price? £5 million. Sinclair Research, Sir Clive's company, has been making big losses, recently estimated at a million pounds a month. Amstrad is a profitable British company built up by Alan Sugar. Now he takes over the making and the selling of the Sinclair computers. It was the day the boffin handed over to the business brain as Sir Clive Sinclair, founder of the British home computer industry, sold out to Alan Sugar, whose Amstrad company only started in computers two years ago. Sinclair still has 40% of the market, but the boom days are over. Everyone agrees he's a brilliant inventor, but his brain children haven't always been reliable or sold well. His latest invention, the C5 electric tricycle, was launched with a fanfare, but never found a market. Today's deal clears most of his debts and leaves him to do what he likes best, research. We are innovators, uh, researchers. We come up with new product ideas, new market ideas. But we've always recognized that once a market flattened in terms of the technology, that we were never going to be able to compete with the experts in mass marketing, mass production, and that we ought to hand over to them. By contrast, Alan Sugar has specialized in marketing, in no-frills designs at cut prices. He's a salesman rather than a scientist. He started up in 1965 selling car aerials. In 1968, he formed Amstrad, an acronym of his own name, Alan Michael Sugar Trading. He produced hi-fi equipment. And by 1980, when Amstrad went public, its market value was eight million pounds. By 1984, Sugar was into personal computers. The company's market value, now 80 million pounds. Today, the market value is £521 million, and the latest target, America. Uh, we bought the Sinclair brand name uh, on computers. Uh, uh, we, we will market the uh, Sinclair computers worldwide. Yet it costs just 300 million. Amstrad's trademark is the hard sell, and now Sinclair should get the benefit. The takeover sent ripples through the London Stock Exchange, but Amstrad's shares soon recovered, with one stockbroker affirming that the city appears to have taken the news in its stride. Amstrad's acquisition of the brand name saw the release of three ZX Spectrum models through the late 1980s, each with varying improvements. The ZX Spectrum Plus 2 was Amstrad's first Sinclair branded machine, coming shortly after their purchase of the Spectrum range and Sinclair brand in 1986. The machine featured an all-new grey enclosed featuring a spring-loaded keyboard, dual joystick ports for the Sinclair Interface 1 and 2 standard, and a built-in cassette recorder dubbed the Data Corder, a bit like the Amstrad CPC-464. The machine was built in Taiwan and UK factories and Amstrad's greater emphasis on quality control made it a far more reliable machine than the Sinclair built Spectrums. Amstrad also took a very different line in marketing the Spectrum Plus 2. 
Unlike Sinclair, Amstrad did not attempt to market the Spectrum as anything other than a games machine, leaving the CPC range to be sold for more serious purposes. Retailers were encouraged to create their own bundles of software and accessories for the machine, so stores such as Curry's and Comet released games of their own choosing. Clever, really. This approach was extremely successful and the Spectrum Plus 2 sold very well. The £5 million investment that Amstrad made in acquiring the Sinclair brand was apparently made back in a year. The machine today is still commonly found with usually just the drive belts of the tape deck needing attention. The new Sinclair Action Pack puts the sack back into computers. The ZX Spectrum Plus 3 looked similar to the Plus 2 but featured a built-in 3-inch floppy disk drive instead of the tape drive and was in a black case. It was launched in 1987, initially retailed for £249 sterling and then later £199 and was the only Spectrum capable of running the CPM operating system without additional hardware. The machine was a fairly big redesign over the Plus 2, with new ports added or changed. Probably the biggest difference was the rear of the machine which now sported an all new interface port for a printer and also for the allowance of a second disk drive. Unfortunately for Amstrad, the machine's high cost and games costing on average £5 more on disk, sales of the computer and software were low. Those who did buy the machine were happy enough to load cassette games in through the sound socket. Since 1986, the company has continued to exist, but in a completely different form. In 1993, 94 and 95, Sinclair made continuing losses of decreasing turnover. Investors became worried that Clive Sinclair himself was using his own personal wealth to fund his inventions. By 1990, Sinclair research consisted of Sinclair and two other employees, down from 130 employees at its peak in 1985. Eventually, the company's entire staff had been reduced to just Sinclair himself, a salesman, administrator and a research and development employee. Let's have a look at the last chapter and the final inventions of Sir Clive Sinclair. In Clive's later years, Sinclair devoted himself to personal transport, coming up with a Zeit electric bike in 1992 and a Zeta electric engine for an ordinary bicycle in 1994. In 1992, the Zeit electric bicycle was released. This was Sinclair's second attempt at changing people's means of transport. It had a maximum speed of 10 miles per hour and was only available by mail order. Much like the C5, the Zeit was a commercial failure and sold only 2,000 units. Become part of tomorrow's world and radically alter our lives. And there's one man who's come up with more than his fair share of these. He brought us the first pocket calculator, the first LED wristwatch, the world's first pocket television, and he revolutionised the home computer market with this. But he has had his fair share of failure too, including the infamous C5 electric tricycle. And now his latest idea to change our lives. Sir Clive Sinclair and his electric bicycle. Welcome, Sir Clive. It whizzes along, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's quite cute. Right, let's start with some practicalities. I gather the top speed is 15 miles an hour. Why is that? That's the legal limit for, for electric bikes. There was legislation in the 80s. They, they could be used just like a bike anywhere. They don't need any licence, no insurance. Anyone over the age of 14 can use one. Well, that's marvellous. Now, it will go <coughs> 10 miles before it needs recharging. Yes. Can you recharge it quickly? Yes, to, just a, uh, one hour for a full recharge, and it'll go up to... 30 miles on, on one of the other options. 10 miles if you don't pedal at all, up to 30 if you do a bit of pedaling. And you're expecting people to do a bit of both, are Yes, you? I think, some, most will, I think, yes. Some. Now, you're a real enthusiast when it comes to electric vehicles, but why do you think you're going to have a success with this? How can you be sure? Because the C5 was a failure, and in the mid-80s, six electric bicycles were launched, and five of them have disappeared. That's right. Why will this work? Well, all those, all those vehicles 
um, had the same, same problem. They used a lead-acid battery, it was extremely heavy, and so bicycles using them ended up weighing 80, 85 pounds minimum, in fact. Um, to overcome that, we've gone to NICAD batteries, which are very, very much lighter, but that alone wouldn't have solved the problem because um, it would still have left, left a very expensive bike and, and uh, still a relatively heavy one. So we've had to take a sort of holistic approach. Um, we've got a, a radical new motor that we've developed for the bike. And the motor's just down there, just down isn't there, it? And, yes. and the battery in, in this in, in, part? In, in the tube, yes. What about um, the motor then? Well, it's only about the size of a teacup and it uses an incredibly, incredible new magnet that's extremely powerful. But so we can get very light weight. We've got very lightweight structure and the overall bike is as light as a racing bicycle. Sir Clive, when I last interviewed you, you said you were working on an electric car. Is yes. it really possible to produce a car that's cheaper than that one in Italy and is still practical? Yes, indeed. Using the sort of technology we've pioneered on the bike, we can come up with a car, we're very confident, that would actually be less expensive than a petrol engine version. Well, good luck. I hope you succeed. Thank you. And goodbye. We'll see you next week on Wednesday as normal. And now I'm going to try this bike. Thank you very much. They're environmentally friendly, but don't want to break into a sweat. A new propulsion device which can be strapped onto almost any standard bicycle. An ordinary bike, but not quite. This one keeps going even when you stop pedalling. The bike itself is perfectly conventional, but on the back, a battery-powered motor drives the wheel, giving the cyclist significant help for up to 30 miles, or 10 if you don't pedal at all. The battery is recharged overnight for less than a penny. It's controlled by a switch on the handlebars, and a lightweight motor drives a belt around a pulley that rests on the tyre when in motion. Pedalling up steep hills is one reason why people don't take up cycling. But with Clive Sinclair's new brainchild, press the button, the battery kicks in, and it becomes easy. The unit fits on any bicycle and costs £150. Anyone over 14 can ride it without a licence or tax. Sir Clive Sinclair believes electric bikes are the transport of the future in towns. We're going to see many cities, indeed big cities, banning petrol-driven vehicles entirely in, in, in not too many years. Several cities on, on the continent are, plan are planning to do that. Uh, I suppose they'll have to let lorries in for a while, but I think all city transport will go electric. Some believe Sir Clive's ideas are simply ahead of their time. Others, especially in the media, have been rather less polite about his previous electric vehicles. This one could run. In June 1997, Sinclair Research released the X1 radio for £9.50. The miniature mono FM radio, powered by a CR2032 battery, had a fixed volume and was inserted in the ear. The X1 radio had only three buttons, an on and off switch, a scan button and a reset button to restart the scanning process. It came with a short length aerial and a detachable ear hook. In 1999, Sinclair released the world's smallest radio in the form of the Z1 Micro AM radio. In 2003, the Sinclair ZA20 wheelchair drive unit was introduced, designed and manufactured in conjunction with Hong Kong's DACA Designs, a partnership which also led to the Sea Do Sea Scooter underwater propulsion unit. You're looking at a conventional wheelchair in use on a typical street, but not quite so conventional as it may first appear. This wheelchair is specially adapted, and it's the first of a new generation. Underneath the chair there's something very new, a wheelchair drive unit, and it's designed to provide electrically powered pushing assistance for most common domestic types of wheelchairs that are propelled along by an attendant, both folding and rigid chairs. The wheelchair drive unit, or WDU for short, is newly launched in the UK in spring 2002 and shortly on world markets. It costs £299 in the UK, around a tenth of the cost of a conventional powered wheelchair. The WDU is the latest brainchild of Sir Clive Sinclair for many Britain's most famous inventor and his research team at Sinclair Research. 
Sir Clive will be remembered for such world firsts as the pocket calculator, pocket television, and perhaps most famously in the early 1980s, the first home personal computers, such as the Sinclair ZX81 and Sinclair ZX Spectrum. More recently, Sir Clive has focused much of his design and development work in the electric propulsion field. Key products in the last few years include the Zyke, an electric bicycle, and Zeta, a special unit to convert any conventional bicycle to a power-assisted one. Now, Sir Clive has applied this technology to the special needs of wheelchair users. According to our research, there are about 400,000 UK users of wheelchairs, conventional non-powered wheelchairs. Most of these are used in a domestic environment. Most of these depend on attendants to propel them, and many of these attendants are themselves elderly or perhaps infirm. The design goal of the wheelchair drive unit was to help these attendants, not to replace them. The most important role for the WDU is to provide climbing support on ramps, hills or inclines. Imagine a tough one in eight hill and a 13 stone user sitting in the chair. The WDU will provide the attendant with 100% of the power needed to climb that hill at a steady 1.7 miles per hour. And on a really tough one in four ramp, the WDU will provide the attendant with 50% of the power needed at the same steady speed. In a typical pattern of use, this new pushing assistant will run for around 60 minutes or four miles, extendable with spare batteries. The whole assembly, including battery, weighs less than 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms. The key innovation lies in the design of the unit's geometry. The Sinclair WDU employs an ultra-efficient rare earth direct current motor. Power is transferred via a reduction gearbox to the special polyurethane drive wheel. This is lifted and lowered by a strap controlled by the attendant. Pivoted from the wheelchair frame, it presses to the ground when driven forward. It's a case of the harder the drive, the harder the grip. And this provides high efficiency since it maintains the optimum pressure between wheel and ground. But it's not an excuse for a new class of wheelchair racing. Sir Clive and his team stress that the maximum speed is limited to just 2.1 miles per hour. And the maximum climbing power is delivered at just 1.7 miles per hour. It's all about assisting the attendant at the right time, in the right place, and at the right speed. So, how does it work? The attendant turns the trigger, fitted to the left handle, to the on position. Then lowers the drive wheel to the ground by using the lifter on the strap attached to the right handle. Now, the attendant presses down on the trigger and simultaneously starts pushing. The Sinclair WDU begins to assist almost immediately. Conversely, if the attendant releases the trigger, power cuts immediately, and bumping up a curb or step, the WDU is raised using the lifting strap. And if the WDU isn't needed for a time, then it's simply parked by placing the trigger in safe mode. Or folded away? Most typical folding chairs will still fold away, even with the unit installed. So, just how easy is the new Sinclair WDU to fit and maintain? The unit attaches to the vertical frame of the chair. This needs to be clear of any obstructions. The telescopic arms are fully extended, ready for fitment. The clamps are snapped onto the frame. If the tube is of narrow diameter, then you insert the supplied black spacers to fill up the space. Now you tighten the clamps, but not completely. They slide on each side of the frame until both are aligned around 25 centimeters, say 10 inches, from the ground. Then the clamps are tightened completely and secured. The correct alignment of the drive wheel is crucial. This is simple but very important. Line up the drive wheel so that it is equidistant from the two wheels and with the groove in the side of the case, vertical. When it's positioned correctly, tighten up the two arm clamps securely. Prior to adjusting the strap length, help the user into the chair and then adjust the drive wheel so that it is one quarter of an inch off the ground. If you do this earlier, the user's weight will lower it back down. And finally, snap 
the switch onto the handlebar. The Sinclair WDU assisted chair is almost ready to go. It just remains to attach the battery, which hangs entirely clear of both wheels and frame. The Sinclair team estimates that a typical first installation should take 10 to 20 minutes and only a moment or two when transferring between chairs. A revolution is coming to Britain's streets. Next time a wheelchair passes you by, take a closer look. It may be one of the very first of the new generation with electrically powered pushing assistance. With the new Sinclair WDU, designed and developed by Sir Clive Sinclair and the Sinclair Research Team. It's available now from Sinclair Research at just £299 in the UK. July 2006 saw the release of the A-Bike, a folding bicycle invented by Clive, which was on sale for £200. It had been originally announced two years previously. And in November 2010, Sinclair Research announced the X1 two-wheel electric vehicle, which failed to reach production. Sometimes your daily journeys can feel like a chore. You just want to get there quicker, without all the stress and effort, and arrive in a good mood. That's why we made a bike that makes your journey shorter, easier and enjoyable. The new A-Bike Electric is the lightest and most compact electric bike. It's really simple, just hop on and A-Bike does the work for you. The dual chain drive makes pedaling easy, the electric power assistance automatically kicks in to keep you up to speed, to keep going, going and going. To power up for your next ride, plug it straight in or charge it somewhere else. It's the lightest electric bike, so it's really easy to carry. Go wherever you want and save time by taking shortcuts. Take on any hill, no effort, no sweat. The award-winning telescopic design means you can fit a bike electric into any journey. So you can take a seat, tuck it away in a taxi and get through the crowds. You don't need to worry about finding a spot in the bike park, just take it in with you. When you arrive, the A-Bike Electric folds away in seconds. The ZX Spectrum Vega is a modern redesign of the ZX Spectrum in the form of a miniaturised TV game created with the involvement of Sir Clive Sinclair. It comes preloaded with several games from the platform. The Vega mimics the look of the original 48K Spectrum computer. However, the keyboard that consisted of 40 rubber keys has been replaced in favour of a simplified layout comprising of only 13 buttons. The console connects to the television via an RCA composite cable and uses a USB cable to draw power. And since the console is meant to be held like a controller, the size of the unit has been reduced to fit in the hands and the cables measure around 3 meters, so it can be comfortably used with some distance between the screen and the user. childhood techno diet went the same way as mine. 
Did you spend the first half of the 80s doing this? Was your minor as manic as this one? Were you partial to a bit of Jet Set Willy? Yep, these eight colour marvels were once the cutting edge of computer entertainment and for many people games like this acted as an introduction to home computing. And this is the man who helped kick off that home computing revolution. Clive Sinclair then, Sir Clive now. He was the brains behind this little box, the ZX Spectrum, the 8-bit wonder that sold millions around the world. It spawned a huge game scene. Thousands of titles, all smaller in size than a modern email, entertained and inspired an entire generation to not only play, but also to code and to invent. Well, now Sir Clive is putting his name to this, the Spectrum Vega, which comes preloaded with a thousand of the original Spectrum games. It is a gaming-centric reincarnation of Sinclair's iconic machine, which exceeded its crowdfunding target in just a couple of days. So with this in mind, I caught up with Sir Clive to talk to him about his passion for games. Did you play any Spectrum games yourself? Never. OK, maybe not for games, but definitely for modern tech. How much of today's technology, modern technology, would you say you use? Oh, well, I don't directly use it myself at all, really. I've got a landline telephone and... No, no. OK, but how about artificial intelligence and the vision he had back in the 80s for the future of computing? I, no, I'm, I'm very impressed by the, the processing power, but I'm not at all impressed by what is done with it. It's, it's, it's really rather dull when you consider how... You know, what we achieved with, with a few K of RAM in those days, it, it, it's, it's a bit sad how very much le it has not progressed from there. Uh, fully expected back then that we would have um, computerised doctors and computerised teachers. You know, letting a, letting a robot operate on you, I suppose. I mean, even if the technology's there, do you think people could ever be persuaded? Too damn right. <laughs> <laughs> would you? Well, not right now, because I know they're not good enough at the moment, but right. one day they'll, they'll, be, they'll, they'll surpass humans. One of the talking points at the moment is the driverless car. Yes. So I suppose that's the kind of thing where we have to give a lot of trust over to. I gave a, a lecture, uh, well, back in the 80s, I gave a lecture where I said, if you'll enjoy driving, um, get on with it now, because you, you'll lose the chance in a, in, in a few decades. Because once they start, and people realise how much safer they are, um, they'll suddenly start passing laws saying, sorry, but you can't drive anymore, you'll have to leave that to the cars. If a driverless car has a crash, who's to blame? Yeah. Is it, is it the maker of the car? Is it the maker of the software? Is it the maker of the sensor? Is it the person that was sat behind the wheel that should have taken over at the last minute? You worry too much. <laughs> <laughs> Do I? Maybe I should have been a lawyer. Thank you so much for seeing us. Great pleasure. Thanks nice to see you again. Place. The inventor of the first home computers that many people had, Sir Clive Sinclair, has died at the age of 81. The Spectrum ZX was launched in 1980 and was effective by the standards of the time and just about affordable. It made him a millionaire and gained him a knighthood. He'll also be remembered for his other eye-catching but ultimately unpopular invention, the Sinclair C5 electric three-wheeler. Takes you back, doesn't it? His daughter said he was still working on new inventions right up until until the end of last week. Sir Clive Sinclair's story will be familiar to many entrepreneurs. Although not all his ventures were successful and he experienced financial ups and downs as a result along the way, he was not deterred and was a very driven inventor and innovator. His contribution to the early development of affordable personal computers has no doubt made a positive contribution to the world of IT that has come to play such an important part in the world of business today. An icon of home computing, he created devices that were enjoyed by millions, the majority of whom would have been unable in the 1980s when his computers were launched to purchase the expensive models on the market. Even Sinclair's so-called failures reveal an inventor who sought to solve everyday problems rather than amass a personal fortune. Anticipating electrified personal transportation, Sinclair developed an electric car, then an electric bike, long before the vogue they both enjoy today. 
Many think that the C5 was before its time and there is a kind of irony that all major car manufacturers are now committed to producing electric vehicles. Although, of course, they look nothing like Sir Clive's work and are much more complex and safer than the C5. These later inventions may have been a business failure, but they were a triumph of the will and the imagination. Sinclair long ago secured his legacy of the father of the home computer, but time is only now vindicating his other creations. Now at least we have the chance to catch up. Sir Clive Sinclair, legend.